sir, that's good. He will do what he says. God's not a liar, folks. All right, have your Bible. Turn book of Galatians, chapter number 6 with me tonight, please. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. This is one of the 13 books that the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament that we're certain of. If he wrote Hebrews, that's 14. But this is one of the 13 books that he wrote. And the book of Galatians is a powerful book in the sense that it goes along with the book of Acts, chapter number 15. You put two of them together and they complement each other. The Bible has three books in the New Testament that are what's called transition books. One of them is the Gospel of Matthew, the other one is the book of Acts, and the other one is the book of Hebrews. What do you mean by transition? The book of Matthew is the transition from the Old Testament into the Jewish kingdom. The book of Acts is the transition from the Jewish kingdom into the Church of God, the Church Age of Grace. And the book of Hebrews is more than likely a transition from this time now of grace into the tribulation period when the Jew is going to deal face to face with the second coming of the Mashiach, the Messiah. So the Bible is definitely laid out in a manner where if you really get a hold of what it says and the way it says it and where it says it and to who it says it, then it begins to make a lot of sense for you. The Bible is not an enigma, folks, wrapped up in a riddle. The Bible is not written to deceive you. The Word of God is written to give you light and understanding. And therefore, if a man lack it, just simply ask of God, who upbraideth not and giveth to all men liberally. Pray. The book of Galatians establishes the authority of the Apostle Paul. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like Paul. They don't like him to this, to this day. They say he created his own Christianity and that uh, what he created was entirely different from what Christ preached when he was here. Remember now, remember, the Sermon on the Mount is the transition from the Jewish Old Testament into the Jewish kingdom, the kingdom age, with the king himself being offered as their king with the kingdom. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Will you say, preachers, anything? Yes, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Every word of God is helpful to us in one manner or another, but it's not all written to us. That's what's important to understand about it. It's not written directly to us. And so therefore, if it's not written directly to us, be very careful before you begin to build doctrine off of Scripture that doesn't, uh, that's not addressed directly to you. So the apostle says in verse number one, Paul, an apostle, not of men, but by Jesus Christ. He chose him, and he chose him after the, the, the twelve. One of them fell. And as our brother quoted just a moment ago, and when he was talking about the ascension of the Lord, Paul was chosen after that ascension took place. Amen. After that, he was chosen, if you'll read, in the book of Acts. The apostle Paul was chosen from the book of Acts to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So therefore, he is a transition apostle. And so when we read things like this, we say, well, now, how does this work? What is it? Why is it important? It's so important today because people confound the scripture and create problems where there really aren't any. And they complicate matters that are simple from the Almighty. The Bible is the word of God, folks. It's a living, living, living thing. In verse number 15 of, first Corinthians, of Galatians chapter number 1, he said, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Yeah. Well, now he's going back to the book of Ephesians, where even before he was ever born, God had a purpose in his life. Even when he was a murdering devil, uh, taking Christians from, Eph from, uh, from Damascus back south into Jerusalem, being a murdering devil, God had still separated him from his mother's womb. And he understands this. He understands that his life had been chosen and had been set aside by the hand of God. Now look in verse number 17. Paul says in, in Galatians 1, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus, into, into Damascus, unto Damascus. Damascus is one of the oldest cities on earth, folks. They still have a street over there called Straight. Just as you read it in the book of Acts, Damascus in Syria is there, has been there, was there 2,000 years ago. 
And so we have, of course, it's a historical narrative that we've got here. And he said that he went into Arabia. I like to think that he went to the Sinai, the same place that Moses got the law. I'm not, I can't prove that, and nobody, can, nobody knows exactly where he went, but it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a you know, romantic-sounding thing that when God, God gave the law at Sinai, he gave grace at Sinai and, 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 and the writing of the Scripture. But in any event, he received it directly from the hand of God. No question about that. God gave Paul this. Why? Because he was the man who was going to lay down the Constitution for the church of the living God. Yeah. Period. Period. And we'll find that issue come up here in the book of uh, Galatians chapter number one when he has to confront uh, the apostle Peter over an issue. If you notice in chapter number two of Galatians and verse number one, it says, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. Why? Because Jerusalem was home base for the faith of Christ. That's where it started, Jerusalem. Yerushalayim is the way they say it in Hebrew. It literally means the city of peace. It has been anything but that for the last 2,000 years. Every kind of a war in the world has been fought there. But when the Prince of Peace comes, he'll bring peace with him, and he'll reign in Jerusalem. So the apostle says in Galatians 2.1 that he went up to Jerusalem and took Titus with him. Now, why did he do that? He did that because that was the seat of the church. Peter, James, and John were the three, the closest to the Lord, the inner circle, and they were there in Jerusalem. And here the apostle Paul is an outsider. He's, uh, he's one that's been saved, but he was saved totally and completely apart from anything going on in Jerusalem. He was saved with a personal confrontation between him and Christ. Yeah. The apostle Paul says, I am one that was born out of due season. And he said plainly that in me, that in Paul, that God should show forth a pattern to them that should hereafter believe. So there's a lot going on with Paul. But notice what's important here, that he went to Jerusalem. Then in chapter number 2 and verse number 14, we read where he confronted Peter. And why did he confront Peter? Well, he confronted him because it's an important issue. Remember now, in verse number 14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, the gospel, not the law, the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? The apostle had vacillated. He had stepped back. He'd crawfished. He had, he had done these things to, to appease the Judaizers. Remember now, the Judaizers are in Acts chapter number 15. They're also here in Galatians. They're trying to mix law with grace. They don't mix Law is not the gospel. The gospel is the grace of God where Christ went to the cross and died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You can put, make a note of this in your Bible or somewhere. 1 Corinthians 15. is There's no better place in the New Testament that spells out the gospel than that place. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel. So, of course, the word gospel means the good news. And to try to keep the law that condemns you is not good news. Good news is somebody, carry, somebody kept the law, paid the righteous demands of the law, established the righteousness of his own, and by the law he could not be found guilty. He was guiltless. And so, therefore, he, 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 he completed all the demands of the law and its righteousness. So in chapter number 2 and verse number 14, the apostle confronts Peter. Now, this is a big deal. Because if you remember Matthew chapter 16, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, he said to them at, at Benias, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Well, Moses, Elijah, one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And this is where Simon Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The biggest problem people make is that they try to make Peter the rock. And Peter's not the rock. The profession of Peter, the declaration of Peter, the confession of Peter, the message of Peter, that's as certainly the rock as anything can be. Think about it for a moment. If the apostle Peter's the rock, what in the world has happened to the rock? Think about it. I mean, already the apostle Paul has to confront him over an issue. No, 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 I don't believe that at all. 
I do not believe that Peter nor any of the apostles were the rock. I believe the confession, the rock, the salvation, he is the rock. And so we accept that as the truth of God. So the apostle confronts him and he confronts him because had they, he allowed this to happen, if he had allowed this to perpetuate, grow, disseminate, and continue on, we'd have a mess. Because you'd have half the churches now believing you have to keep the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws, by the way, you can add them in there if you want to for good measure and all the rest of that to be saved. And the Apostle Paul says, no man ever kept the law. Neither, neither you that preach it, you didn't keep it. Nobody ever kept it. It was a burden that we couldn't keep. You remember what he said in the book of Romans chapter number seven? Oh, wretched man that I am. What's he talking about? He's talking about the law of sin and death. Law of sin and death. The law that condemned his flesh. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. That's an honest man, though. I can appreciate honesty, can't you? If a man or a woman is honest with you, then you can get to the root of the issue and you can communicate with each other. But if they put this charade up before you and hide behind some wall of something, you'll never be able to communicate with them and you'll never get to the bottom of anything. But if they just come to the point as my, as my grandfather used to say, own up to it. <laughs> How many's ever heard that before? That's just plain colloquial speech. Own up, you did it, own up to it. Quit making excuses for it. You're the dirty rat. <laughs> I never did like owning up to it, but I had to own up a few times because <laughs> it was mine, amen. I did it. It's my sin. Not your sin, it's my sin. Yeah. That's why when I got saved, God forgave me not for your sins, but for my sin. That's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot in that. So Peter was dealt with. And this does it. This is no wise written to denigrate Peter. Folks, Peter was the apostle who wrote the book. I love First and Second Peter. He wrote these books. They're wonderful books in the Bible. But he did because of human weakness, like Barnabas did. By human weakness. Like, for example, what's Moses' brother's name? You remember him? Aaron. Aaron. What did Aaron do? You remember what Aaron did? Yeah. These be thy gods, O Israel which have brought us out of Egypt. And he showed them Apis, the bull, the golden calf. There they were. And when Joshua was on top of that mountain, heard the noise, he said, this is the sound of war that we hear. No, Moses knew better. He had spiritual discernment. His brother could not be trusted. His brother could not be trusted with the propagation of the truth. That went into the hands of Moses. See how it does? God uses good people. He uses good men, good women. But only a few he puts his hand on and says like he did of Abraham, I know him. He'll stand true to the truth. And that's what's important because you know the truth and truth will do what? It's right. It has to be the truth. Now, don't you look at chapter number three of Galatians and verse number one. The apostle Paul said, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? That word bewitched is baskino. I know that's a Greek word, but here's what it means. An evil eye. That's what it means. You go look at the etymology of the word evil eye. In other words, the old ancients thought there was a case where an evil eye could be cast upon someone and a spell could be brought upon them. A curse could be brought against them. And the apostle Paul is saying these Judaizers have come into your midst and they have come into your midst to cast a curse upon you. If they're bringing a, this is, I don't know if he could have used any stronger talk. Who hath bewitched you? Notice how he made it a spiritual thing too. Because that's where the devil does his dirtiest work. He does it in the realm of the spirit, not the flesh. Everybody's got a problem with flesh. Good night. It is the spirit. Because the only thing that can give you victory over the flesh is your spirit. If the spirit is right, the flesh has to be right. Because you can bring it into subjection. But without the spirit being right, you can, you can try to clean your flesh up all you want to. And you can, you can smell good in one area and stink in another. That's the flesh, folks. The flesh will never, ever, ever be right, righteous, and right with God. It's cursed and it goes to the curse. So he said in verse number three, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. Where before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. So the apostle had put his heart and soul into peach, preaching and teaching these Galatians. And they had received it. He said, at one time you said you'd plucked out your very eyes for me. For the message that I brought to you. I brought you a liberating message. Freedom. Brought you salvation. I taught you, I taught you about the grace of God. 
and taught you these things. And now here these Judaizers come in and they, and this is always the way they work. Like I said this morning, they never, they never win anybody to the Lord because they don't know how they take you once you are born again and they want to turn you into one of their disciples. That's the way it operates. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the way. They'll say to you, oh, well, that's good. You got started. Now, let me show you so much, so much more that you can have. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. Right. I remember them telling me that one time. I hadn't been saved too long, and I was very, very, very. Believe me, I am born again. I wanted everything God Almighty said in his word, everything he did. And I mean, I went after it tooth and toenail. And I went to this church, and there was so, everybody in there was so full of the Holy Ghost. And I thought, Lord, I'm in the, I'm in the place. I mean, I've never seen the like in my life. And my wife is more practical woman than I am. <laughs> Much more practical. And I went there Sunday morning and the crowd, big crowd, house full of people, shouting, glorifying, carrying on. Went back Sunday night, wasn't quite as many people. About half as many, didn't come back. And then Wednesday night, they didn't even meet in the auditorium. They met in the basement. And she looked over at me and said, uh-huh. Now, just exactly what do these people have that you don't have? You're here, where are they? That's all it took. I got up, walked out, and I thought to myself, this is just a bunch of junk. And that's what it was, just a bunch of man-made junk. And so God used that to begin to direct, redirect me in a different path. And uh, I, I'm just a little confession tonight, you'd be surprised how many paths I've been down. <laughs> Amen. But here I am, I'm back. <laughs> Thanks be unto God. Lord knows, though. Lord let me get away with things in the first two or three or four or five years of my salvation. He let me get away with things, checking stuff out, going to places, doing this, doing that, that he would never do now because I know too much now. I know better. I didn't know better then, but I know better now. I don't blame someone who wants to get closer to the Lord. I don't blame you for that. I don't blame you for being wanting to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But be very, very careful about the people like these who want to bewitch you. They want to come in and they want to say something to you. Notice in verse number six of chapter number three of Galatians. The Apostle Paul brings in an argument here that you, that you, you cannot refute. Look what he says in verse number six. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So the Apostle Paul's argument is that righteousness does not come by the keeping of the law. Righteousness comes by faith. You see, the Judaizers could only go back to Moses. That's as far as they could go. They had to go back to Sinai. They couldn't go any further back. Okay. Well, Moses lived 1,400 years before Christ. Okay, that's Moses. Now, folks, don't blame Moses. He's not the one that did it. It's the people who misinterpret and try to use him. But Moses... 1,400 years before Christ. Now go back another 500 years. Go back another 500 years before the law or Sinai or any of that ever happened. And you go back to Abraham, 1,900 years before Christ. And Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Before the law was ever given, Abraham was justified. He was, he was declared righteous. He was saved. All these things happened to him 500 years before the law was ever given. Now that ought to put a thinking cap on your head and you ought to do some real serious thinking. And this is what Paul's doing with these Galatians. He said, look at this, 500 years. Now look at verse number 10. For as many as are the works of the law are under its curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, James says it in another way, says the same thing. He said, if you are guilty in one point of the law, you're guilty in all, every bit of it. See this? See this? Perfection cannot come from what you do. Perfection came at Calvary for what's been done. What you do now tonight is not try to redo what Christ did. What you do tonight is to accept what he did and say, Lord, I fall at your feet. I fall before you guilty. I'm a guilty sinner. Lord God Almighty, save me for Jesus' sake, for what's been done at the cross, for whatever words that come out of your soul, you're reaching up from your heart and you're taking hold of the Son of God. That's your salvation is a person. So in verse number 10, by the works of the law. But look at verse number 14 of Galatians chapter number 3. 
He said, the blessings of Abraham, now look at this carefully. Abraham's father was Eber. Abraham was never called a Jew a day in his life. What was he called? A Hebrew. All right. The word Jew shows up when we, over in the book of, somebody tell me that. What's his name? Mordecai? What book in the Bible is that? All right. Mordecai. What book does he show up in? That's it. You got her. Ishtar. Hadassah. Esther. Okay. See the changing of the name and all that. The book of Esther. Mordecai. The Jew. Is what he calls him. That's a different thing entirely tonight. I'm not up here to run Jews down. But the point is, Abraham was a Hebrew. In other words, the truth came to the Hebrew. Here he blessed the Hebrew. And the Hebrew language is what the Old Testament is written in. Hebrew. You go down the streets of Tel Aviv or Jerusalem today, do you know what language you'll hear? You'll hear Hebrew. That's quite a remarkable thing. It really is. You're listening to a language thousands of years old. And Ethelbert Bullinger says this. Now, Bullinger's father was, 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 uh, was, was part of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Reformation back in the time of Zwingli and the rest of them. But here's what Bullinger says. Bullinger says that Hebrew is its own source, that there is no language that you can find that Hebrew was taken from. Okay. It's an original language of its own. And, you know, I, I, I agree. He was indefatigable. The guy never wore out. He was, he was untiring. And, uh, and Bullinger was something else. And so he says that Hebrew, being that, is a pure language. Therefore, when God speaks through Hebrew, God's speaking in nuances that you don't necessarily get in a language like English. He's speaking to the people in a sense of feeling where they understand him in revelation. So Hebrew is important language. Abraham was a what? He was a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. So what language did Adam speak? Hebrew. I'd say he spoke Hebrew. Oh. Yes, sir. Man in Hebrew is Ish. Woman in Hebrew is Isha. They had uh, Aleph, the first letter of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the only difference in the name. Hebrew. So I feel blessed today. Yeah. I do. Every time I get on there and I hear them speaking in Hebrew, I think, good night, man. Isaiah could walk down the street of Jerusalem and they could talk to Isaiah and Isaiah could talk to them and they wouldn't Amen. miss a word. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's something, isn't it? For God to protect, for God to raise up that language again now. Yes. He's raised it up. It's in vogue, folks. That language is being used every day of your life. Right now, 2023, Hebrew, the same Hebrew that the Old Testament saints spoke and, and lived in. So he said in verse number uh, verse number 14, the promise of the Spirit, the promise of faith came through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Now I want you to look at verse number 19. This is a very interesting thing here. He, uh, Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 19. Wherefore? Then serveth the law. So what was, what's it about? It was added because of transgressions till the seed. See the seed? Yeah. All right. Seed. Yeah. Seed of the woman. Genesis 3.15. Yeah. They call it the protoevangelium. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. All right. And it was ordained by angels with the hand of a mediator. Now look at this thing carefully. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. So the apostle says in the book of Romans, I had not known sin without the law. But he said the law came, sin revived, and I died. Yeah. So therefore, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Yeah. All right. So by the law, I'm going to be saved because it told me what my sins were. So I turned to the law to save me, right? No. no. The only thing the law could do is shed light on your fallen condition. That's right. You need a Savior. Yeah. But look what he says here. This is interesting. This is very interesting. Verse 19, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Don't you think about this for a moment. The Lord took them to, to, to Ebal and Gerizim. All right, Joshua. Joshua took the law at Ebal and Gerizim. Mount Ebal, Ebal in Hebrew, and that's a Hebrew word, means, it means fool, Cur cursed, fool. Gerizim in Hebrew means blessed. And to this day, the Samaritans have a temple, what's left of it, on the top of Gerizim. 
Mount Gerizim. And when the Lord met the woman at the well in John 4, John chapter before, she was talking about in this mountain our fathers worship God. Well, she was talking about Gerizim. That was the mountain. But here he stands. He stands before them. And they have Ebal on one side and Gerizim on the other side. And they said, all that the Lord hath said, we will do. They didn't they? Did they do? No. They failed to. Did it cost them? Yes, it did. All right, how do you answer this question? Notice carefully, verse number 19 again. It was added because of transgressions. What law did Abraham live under? I know the law of Hammurabi and all that junk. You get into reading the Old Testament. You get into all that stuff where, where Abraham was supposed to have been raised under the law of Hammurabi. Hammurabi goes back to Babylon. And that uh, they, take a, they try to contrast the law of Hammurabi with the Old Testament text. There may be some comparisons in there, but it doesn't have anything to do with the revelation of God. Okay? These are things that's, these are, this is the stuff that so-called scholars deal with. You don't have to worry about Hammurabi. Ham has ever heard of him. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. All right. But Abraham, Abraham was justified. He was saved. He was blessed. He received the promise. He became the father of all the nations. His name was changed from Abram, father, to Avraham, high father. All of this was given to this one man before the law was ever given. All right. What about his descendants? Isaac and Jacob. What about them? What about these are the patriarchs? The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Leah, to this day, Israel says she built the house of Israel. It was Leah. She was the first one to bring forth children. All right. Were these people saved? Of course they were saved. Every, if, if, every one of them that fell under the promise of Abraham and lived what Abraham taught and preached, they were saved. They were saved before the law. Then why was the law given? This is the point. See, this is the point. This is the point. The law was added. It was brought in later on to show the children of Israel, you have long since departed and deviated from the teachings of your father Abraham. You remember what the Jews said to Christ when he was here 2,000 years ago? They said, we are of our father Moses. Is that what they said? No. Mm -mm. What did they say? Abraham. Abraham. They went all the way back to Abraham and not to Moses. Why? Because Abraham was the father of the faithful. And it was through Abraham that this promise, the promise, the promise of the seed by faith came. Amen. How did Mary receive the seed of God in the book of Matthew? How do you think she received that? By faith. Amen. By faith. She said, be it unto me, to thy handmaid. This is what the Lord wants for me. I shall receive it. And so therefore by faith. And so the argument of the Apostle Paul is strong. The argument is this. How in the world are you trying to drag the law in any part of it, any, any aspect of it? Why are you trying to drag this into the law of grace when Abraham was justified by grace, by faith, by the promise of God and all of this before the law ever showed up? What's going on with you people? Go back to Abraham. Go back to him. And the Judaizers don't like Abraham. They don't like him because he doesn't fit. And so this is what happens to them. The Bible says in the book of uh, chapter number five of Galatians. Galatians 5, 16. Now look at this, look at the wording of this and see if you can find another place in the Bible that's practically word for word. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See this? Here's the apostle telling them to walk in the spirit. See this? All right. Now when he appealed to the spirit, folks, he appealed to an infinitely higher order. Okay? Yes. Infinitely higher to walk in the spirit. Is there somewhere else in the New Testament that he tells them? Look at Romans 8, verse 1. Look at Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 1. How many of you like the book of Romans? Romans, something else, folks. Romans chapter number 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh. Oh, I'd hold your place right there. Think about the preceding chapter, chapter 7. There dwelleth in my flesh no good thing. With the flesh I serve the law of sin. O oh, wretched man that I am. Okay, we've got the flesh nailed down. Now look at verse, eight, verse 1 again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but how? There we are, see? Saying the same thing. The apostle's consistent. Here he says to walk after the Spirit. Then in Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 16, he says to them plainly, they walk in the Spirit. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you won't. But it's not easy to do. So how do you do it? How do you walk in the Spirit? Well, I think the answer is found in 1 John. I know I've worn it out with you. But if you'll turn over here to the book of 1 John. 1 John. I can't get rid of this plague. 1 John. Chapter number one. Let me get over here. And we're going to find it in a minute. Oh, here we are. Here we are. First John. Chapter number one. And it's all it's talking about walking. Okay. Walk in the spirit. All right. Here we are. We're going to walk. First John chapter one, verse five. This is. Then is the message which we've heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Now here's what walk means. It means the manner of life. It means how you're living your life. That's what it means. And of course, you know, the Old Testament text, it says, can two walk together except they be agreed. All right. Now look at verse six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now here, you've had this before, I know you have, but I want you to read, when we read this scripture, I want you to think, is this scripture reading me? Is it looking at my motive? Is it reaching into the depths of my soul? Because there are people out there who do not believe they sin. There are preachers standing in the pulpit that believe they're sinless. They believe they've been forgiven and they can't think of anything they've done today. So everything's okay between them and God. So they're relying completely upon their own mind and sense of righteousness. And when the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Well, the Lord answers. I, the Lord, I try the reins. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent the motive of the heart. So your motive is going to be checked. I give you fair warning right now. <laughs> your motive is going to be put to the test right now. Look at verse number seven. But if we walk in the light, if we walk in the spirit, there's no difference. They're synonymous. They mean the same thing. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth, is cleaning us from all sin. It is a constant thing. Why is it constant? Because it has to be. That's, right. That's why. It has to be. None of us can walk in perfection. No. You want to live for the Lord? I do too. But I'll be honest with you tonight. I'll have to say with Paul, of all the sinners on this earth, I'm chief. Amen. And I'd have to say with him, oh, wretched man that I am. Verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And let me say something while I'm at this. I know we've had some teachers in the country who teach that when the scripture refers to the blood of Christ, that it's not really referring to the actual blood of Christ that has been sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven. And that blood, therefore, is, is a witness and an evidence of the, of, the, of the blood covenant. They teach that the blood of Christ is simply symbolical of the sacrifice that was made at the cross. That's garbage. There's nothing, sim, there's no symbolism involved in cleansing your sin. Nothing can wash away your sin. Nothing but the blood. Who hath begotten us in Revelation 1 5 and washed us from our sins in his own sacrifice. In his good life. No. 
He hath washed us from our sins in the baptismal pool. Church, get the best church you can find. That'll do the job. He hath washed us from our sins in what? His own blood. There's too much reality to that for me to think that this thing is symbolical. But look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You may not be able to put your finger on it. Really, I'm seriously. And you may not be able to say, well, now, Lord, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. But the truth of the matter is, you get down to your prayer closet tonight, shut the door, turn the lights out, spend a little time in there with God. You'll be surprised what the Holy Ghost says to you. But it doesn't say you've lost your fellowship with him. Uh -uh. Now look at verse number eight. And see, this is where people get real angry. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. All right, are you offended with this? Does your, does your church teach that this is only for backslidden Christians? Because I was in some churches like that. Or does your church teach that this is for all believers? All the time. That you walk in the light as he is in the light. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. This is what we need to do tonight, folks, is walk in the spirit. Yeah. How do you walk in the spirit? You walk in the light of the spirit. How do you walk in the light of the Spirit? You walk in the light of the Spirit when the Holy Spirit puts His hand on some aspect of your life, some point that He wants to deal with, then you confess it right then. Immediately you confess it. And by doing that, it's immediately cleansed by the blood of Christ. And your fellowship is unbroken with the Lord. And that's what's going on here in 1 John chapter number 1. To me, that's a beautiful thing. It, it, it really is. Because I know how sorry and low down I am. I don't know about you. And I'm serious when I talk like that. I listen to some of these guys, and I swear you'd think that they hadn't sinned in 30 years. But I'll tell you the truth, I, I, it's not the world I live in. Amen. I, I'm going to tell you something. In 1973, when God saved me, I wasn't worth the powder and lead to blow me to hell. I wasn't worth a dime. I was as sorry as they come. Amen. And then I raised my head up, and glory to God, I was in a brand new world. <laughs> I've been trying my best to tell people about that world ever since then. I wish, I hope you know. Oh, I hope you know who I'm talking about tonight. I hope you know him. I hope you know who I'm talking about. I hope you do. No, nobody's ever kept it. It's impossible for you to keep it. That's impossible. Because God has designed it so to where he forces you to turn to him in obedience, in confession, in contrition. A broken and a contrite spirit, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. That's a simple thing. It's a simple thing. Here's the bad thing about sin. Okay? There's a lot of bad things about it. But this is one of the worst things about sin. Maybe you did some little Mickey Mouse something today. You know, no big deal. You know that. Nobody's ever going to know anything about it. And, and uh, you know, it'll be all right. It will give birth to something else. And when it gives birth to something else, the something else will be worse than it was. And it will give birth to something else. And then it begins to grow. And then it takes hold of you. And then you have a stronghold inside you built by Satan. And he moves into that stronghold. Then he takes complete possession of your life. And it all started with some little Mickey Mouse nothing. Nothing. And you allowed it to grow and not confess it. I'd ask you tonight. It's a simple thing. Lord, you know, I, I said something I shouldn't have said today. Well, look, God says, confess it. I'm going to cleanse you for it right now. Well, you know, Lord, I had my eyeball laid on something I shouldn't have been looking at. Well, confess it, and I'll forgive you for it right now and cleanse you for it. Well, Lord, I said something about so-and-so. and Well, confess it right now, and I'll cleanse you for it. And you can walk in fellowship with me. Because it will not stop until it is finished. And sin, when it is finished, James says, bringeth forth death. Father, bless your holy word. Oh, God, may you bless your people. Maybe somebody in this house tonight needs to come and say, Lord, what that preacher said is the truth. He spoke to me. He spoke the truth. And I need that fellowship with you, Lord. I've got to walk in light. I've got to walk in the spirit. I can't make it if I don't. 
confess that to him and tell him how important that is to you and bring it to him tonight because he wants to walk with you. He wants to walk. He knows you. He knows what you're made out of. He knows what's in your heart and he wants to walk in fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.